subscribe, click the notification bell, and follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you'll never miss another scary video. If you are subscribed, click that like button. Thank you. Of course, it's a rainy day. You're running late leaving work, and now you're late to pick up your daughter from daycare. You drive over the speed limit, hoping your child isn't upset. You even plan to get her some ice cream to make up for it. But when you arrive, the daycare is closed. You run out into the rain and ask the woman locking up the front door, wait, where's my daughter? She smiles, but to your terror, she replies. Her father came to pick her up. Yet, her father hasn't been alive since she was one. Where is your daughter? Enjoy these creepy daycare stories with our guest, Unit 522, and sit back with the sounds of rain. If you like Unit, please subscribe to his channel via the link in the description. One. Daddy Daycare by Markel. When I was younger, my mother, a single mother by the way, had trouble finding work and taking care of me. My grandparents were estranged and ignored the existence of my mother, apparently because I was a mixed child, so she had no one to help her look after me. Luckily, soon enough, she found a well-paying job as a receptionist for a local politician, which allowed her to place me into daycare. But what daycare? She had only a few days to figure this out before the first day of her job began. My mom has always been a very open person, open-minded, that is, and she loved to save money whenever possible. As such, when she saw a certain local daycare that ran at half the rate of the others, she was excited but there was a catch. The caretakers were men, self-proclaimed single fathers themselves, who promised to take care of your children as well as any mother could. That didn't sway her otherwise, so the day came where she needed to head to work, and I was moments from being dropped off at this so-called daddy daycare. But as my mother came to my side of the vehicle to let me out, she paused, changed her mind, and called her new employer to request extra time. Thankfully, she was allowed some. I always wondered why she suddenly changed her mind, though. Well, I'm glad she did. A week after that, the daycare was swatted, and a child ring was uncovered, if you know what I'm saying. The men that ran the place weren't so much looking after your kids, they were having their way with your kids. When I was older, I asked her what had changed her mind all of a sudden. It had been my grandparents. Apparently, they had a change of heart literally seconds before I was dropped off, and they called my mother as she walked around my side of the car. In a matter of seconds, my grandparents had saved me. Later on, they would become the greatest people in my life. That was a very, very close call. Two, something strange happened to a baby at daycare by you slash daycare throwaway and read by unit 522. I still can't get what happened last week out of my head. It doesn't fit together at all. I haven't been able to get any rest for the past few days just thinking about it. So I figured that I would just write it down here and see if any of you have better luck explaining it. I work in a daycare. It's a pretty established place in a big city on the coast. That's all I can say. I still work there, and I don't want someone linking this post back to my employer. I'm not supposed to talk about anything that happens to the kids online. We mostly cater to the professional crowd, busy people in finance and internet startups. It's a common sight to see someone in a business suit dropping off a baby with a large cup of Starbucks in the other hand. People who can afford 25 bucks a week on coffee, go figure. One of our attractions is that we offer daycare for infants as well. Lucy C. was by far my favorite baby. Lucy is her first name, which is all I'm prepared to share. Working in a daycare, we all have our favorites. We're not like parents, 
having to spread the love out equally. When you're faced with four screaming babies, you grow to like the quiet ones more than the others. Lucy was as close to a perfect baby as you could get. She wasn't much of a crier, unless her diaper was full. She went to sleep like clockwork. She had a crown of wispy blonde hair, which contrasted her piercing cornflower blue eyes. Mr. C, as far as I could gather, was a self-made businessman, one of those internet startup companies. I never knew exactly what he did, and the five-minute handovers in the morning really didn't make for startling revelations about his hopes and dreams. He was always dressed very sharply. I'm not much for chasing fashion, but some of the other girls whispered designer labels that I only ever heard about in celebrity magazines when they referred to his latest threads. He seemed genuinely pleasant, if a little distracted in the mornings. I had never seen a Mrs. C. There was an Abigail C. on the emergency contact form, but she was listed as his sister. I know some of the others joked about whether he was on the market, so to speak, when they would see his sports car pull up to drop off little Lucy in the mornings, but that was just our equivalent to locker room talk. He was awfully rich, successful in an ecosystem which chewed up and spat out a hundred other young businessmen every year. It was some kind of magic touch, the other said. Coming out of nowhere and building up something like that. The young entrepreneur of the year and all that jazz. I try and think back to that morning last week. Did Mr. C look strange that morning when he dropped Lucy off? To be honest, I've been over those five minutes a hundred times in my head in these past few days. His suit was immaculate. He greeted me like he did with the rest of the staff. A warm smile, a kiss for Lucy and a gentle request for us to take good care of his girl. Pretty much the same thing the other 20 or so parents would say. Maybe there really wasn't anything wrong. I keep on thinking back because if things had gone differently, I might have been able to save Lucy. Shit. I don't know why I said that. Lucy is fine. Or she should be. I don't know why I can't get it out of my head that I made a terrible mistake. Why there's a guilt I feel whenever I check in at work and look at her favorite toys on the playroom floor. The children were taking their afternoon nap. The chime told me that there was someone at the desk. The other staff were busy with cleanup, so I went to go see who it was. We didn't have any early pickups scheduled, so I thought it might be someone making inquiries. This guy was dressed in a suit, same as most of the other parents. It was a rich part of town. My breath caught a little when I saw him. He was actually really good looking. Not your high school crush good looking. I mean this guy looked like he was plucked straight from a fashion magazine. He stepped up to the counter and flashed his perfect white smile at me. There was something about this guy. I mean the smile made me go a little weak at the knees. And it's embarrassing to say this, but it also gave me a bit of a tingle down on my pants. If you know what I mean. Then comes the strange part. As soon as I felt that spark of arousal, it got drowned in this terrible feeling. I felt dirty, shameful. The kind of dirty that makes you feel like you'll never be able to scrub it off. When the man spoke, he had a sort of radio voice. You know, kind of deep and smooth. Mr. C and I had an arrangement. I'm here to collect Lucy, he said. He didn't introduce himself and I just stood there and gawked at him. He just stared back at me, his eyes twinkling with good humor from that devilishly handsome face, like he already knew a punchline to a joke. It was an odd request, but we do get third-party pickups from time to time, but it's very rare. We either need to be told in advance, or be informed personally by the parents. Nobody mentioned that Lucy was going to be picked up that day, I told the man that we couldn't do it unless we had authorization from the parent. He stared at me for a few more moments, seemingly in deep thought. He smiled and told me that everything had been arranged. He gestured towards my phone on the table. Just then, it rang. I jumped. I was a little more on edge than I should have been. This strange man was making me very nervous. He had this weird aura around him. It was intimidating. His stare made my breath catch in my throat. On the phone screen it said Mr. C's name. That was odd. 
how did he have my number? And I didn't have his number stored on my personal phone. It was a FaceTime call as well. I accepted the call. Mr. C's face filled the screen. Something was off. At first, I thought it was a connection issue. There was a lag. His lips were out of sync with his voice. It was a very disconcerting image, like a poorly dubbed film. Hey, there's a guy over there with you, right? Mr. C had a look of intense concentration on his face. There was something else there. There was a mark on his cheek. It was a bit too small and too blurry on the phone screen to really make it out. But I knew for certain that it had not been there when he left Lucy this morning. It was an angular shape, about the size of a quarter. Uh, yes there is, sir. I was mesmerized by the video feed. You need to give Lucy to him, you hear? Just give him Lucy. His tone was urgent. There was something else about those flapping lips. They seemed to be repeating the same thing over and over. If you say so, Mr. C. Is there something wrong? Nothing is wrong. Just give him Lucy. It'll be fine after that. I could see a slight parting of his lips, a small roll of his tongue for the second word, and it was repeating over and over again. If you find this a little confusing, what I'm trying to say is that his lip movement was not matching what he was saying. I looked back up at the man. He was standing there with a smirk on his face. Um, I'll be right back. I slowly made my way over to the nursery. I kept thinking about Mr. C's face on the phone screen. It looked like he was trying to say something with an S and an L. I turned the words around in my head. What could Mr. C have been trying to say? S. L. Save. Save. Lucy? I stood over the crib where she was sleeping. She gave a gurgle of complaint as I scooped her up into my arms. Save Lucy. Could that be what Mr. C was saying? Did he know about the man at the counter? What agreement did they have? My mind was clouded with questions. But I had been given direct instruction by the parent. Maybe there was some home emergency or something else. The man seemed to beam as I returned to the counter with Lucy. There was a smoky smell about him. He didn't look like somebody who smoked, with his perfect white teeth and toned physique. He reached out for Lucy, but then I spoke up. How do I know that you're the man that Mr. C told me about? I said defiantly, not intending to let her go without a fight. Oh, Mr. C and I go way back. You could call me a godfather almost. His mouth seemed to twist as he said the word God, like it had left a sour taste in his mouth. I've been watching her since she was a baby. Here, I'll prove it. She has a small birthmark on her left hip. Check and see for yourself. Now, I had changed the baby's diapers many times. I knew them almost as well as their parents did. Maybe even better. And I knew that Lucy had no such birthmark. I placed Lucy on the table and tugged at her diaper, expecting to see pale skin. My mouth fell open when I saw that angry red mark on her hip. That wasn't all. This mark was familiar. It was the same exact mark that had been on Mr. C's cheek. I try and tried to remember what that mark looked like, but every time I do, it's slippery in my mind, like trying to grasp a fish. It was small and angular. Almost like one of those runes that they have in fantasy novels. That's the worst thing. I stared at it for a good five minutes, and I can't even form a shape in my head when I try to remember it. You seem reluctant, young lady. I assure you that no further inconvenience will befall you regarding this matter. The business is between me and baby Lucy here. He leaned in forward onto the counter. It's a slow day. I suppose that you and I could come to some small agreement for the handover. The child's needs will be given willingly, and I would hate for this to be delayed any further than it already has. The smell of smoke grew stronger. I picked up the baby and hugged her to my chest. She began to squall at the uncomfortable pressure. I'll need to speak to my supervisor about this, I said. The man sighed and straightened up. I was really hoping to be done with this business this afternoon. No matter. 
What's due to me will come in the end. If not from you, then maybe from someone else more... amendable. I turned around to get my manager, but when she called back to me, I turned back to the counter, and the man was gone. Without so much as a chime from the door, I shook my head. He had been there a moment before, and there hadn't been a single noise when he disappeared. He left nothing but the faint smell of smoke and a freezing cold spot on the counter where he had rested his elbows. I informed my manager that someone had come by to pick Lucy up, but left without her. My manager, Jane, looked Mr. C up on the register and gave him a call from the counter phone. I watched, biting my lip, as her jaw dropped and all the color drained from her face. You must be mistaken. Mr. C... Oh, well... Yes. Yes, Lucy's here. Okay. She swallowed and took in a shuddering breath. That was the cops. Mr. C is dead. After dropping Lucy off this morning, he drove straight to his office and blew his brains out. Jane and I were both in shock. Jane eventually got a hold of herself. She managed to call up the emergency number from the register and got a hold of Abigail C., Mr. C.'s sister. The cops informed Jane that they weren't going to pick Lucy up. Abigail was out of town, but said that she would be by to pick up Lucy first thing in the morning. This meant that we would have to keep Lucy overnight. Jane offered to pay me double to stay there overnight with Lucy, and I would get the next day off. It was the practical decision. None of the staff had small children at home, and it just would be easier to leave the baby in a familiar environment, rather than move all the stuff to one of our houses. I settled down for the evening. Dinner was some forgettable microwaved package out of the fridge. At least the place was set up for sleeping over. I had been given a couple hours off to grab an overnight bag and a shower. One by one the rest of the staff said goodbye, until it was just me and Lucy. I couldn't shake this feeling that there was someone else in the daycare with us. The kind of feeling you get on the small hairs on the back of your neck. That something isn't quite right. I chalked it up to the experience I had with a strange man earlier that day. And that bizarre, impossible phone call. I checked on Lucy for maybe the fourth or fifth time. She was sound asleep. Sleep came less easy for me. Lucy's crying woke me up. I rushed over to the next room to check on her. She didn't need to be changed. It was only after I wiped my eyes that I saw the indention of a hand on the clean white sheets of her crib. It was a big print. Surely a man's hand. I didn't have to touch it to know that it would be freezing cold just like the countertop, but I did it anyway. I retracted my hand right away as the cold sheet burnt my finger. It was almost like putting my finger on an ice cube straight out of the freezer. I scooped up Lucy and hugged her to my chest. I was startled by my phone ringing from the next room. I set Lucy down, went back over to my room, and looked at my phone. It was Mr. C again. It took me at least three times to hit the end button, my finger quivering and missing a little spot on the touch screen over and over. I immediately ended the call, but my phone sounded again, and again, and again until I turned it off. I stared at it, chest heaving. Have you ever wondered what goes through your mind when there's nothing pumping through your veins but ice and you have no emotion but raw primal fear? That's all there is. Your instincts take over and you look for an escape. But what was there to run from? The feeling that I was being watched by that strange man? The phone calls I was getting from the dead Mr. C? I turned on all the lights in the daycare. I didn't care about the power bill. I felt trapped by these walls with cheery designs on them. I looked at the clock. It was 3 a.m. Three more hours until the first light. I held Lucy tighter. Those were the longest three hours of my life. A knock on the front door woke me up. A tall, thin woman stood outside of the glass doors. She was dressed as if she was attending a funeral wearing black from head to toe. I let her in. She introduced herself as Mr. C's sister. Sensing my doubt, 
She showed me her driver's license and her phone which had the same number that was on our records. Lucy didn't complain when the lady picked her up. I got the release form ready and passed it over for her to sign. Everything checked out except for one thing. She didn't have a trace of sadness around her, apart from a little dark under her eyes. It was funny for someone whose brother had just shot himself. She flashed me a smile as she pushed the signed form back across the glass counter. I watched her stride confidently back out through the glass doors. There was something out of place about Abigail. From someone else more amendable. That's what the man said. If not me, then someone else. There was a thud as the door closed. The wind lifted the woman's hair from the collar of her dress, and there, red and raw on the nape of her neck, was that same red mark. By the time I got out from behind the counter and through the door, they were both gone. It's been a week. Mr. C didn't have any family in town. The authorities never followed up on anything. They called to make sure that she had been handed over to the appropriate guardian, but that was it. I had frequently tried dialing both Mr. C's number as well as his sister. The numbers were alive for a day or so, but now they're disconnected. I've tried for hours to remember the symbol that was on Lucy's hip, the bizarre thing that appeared the day her father died, but I can't. I just can't visualize it. I wonder what kind of agreement that man had with Mr. C and how Lucy fit into the whole thing. I hope that Lucy is okay and that I'm just being paranoid. I know deep in my heart that this is a lie that I tell myself to have any semblance of normalcy after that day. Most of all, I cannot forget the face of that strange man with the perfect smile and those freezing cold hands. I lie awake at night, hoping that I'll just forget him, and maybe, just maybe, he won't remember me. 3. The Father I Never Wanted to Know by Anon 3622 I don't remember the first time it happened, because I was very young. My mother told me the story a few years afterward, when I was old enough to understand what went on. The first time led to many other times, and from those times comes this long story that was a large part of my life. Let me explain. I grew up in a small house in a run-down neighborhood with my mom and my older brother. We were very poor, and my mom had a problem with pills. My mother and father split up when I was a baby. My mother always taught me that I was to stay away from anyone who claimed to be my father, and whenever she would bring him up, my brother would cower in fear at the mention of him. You could see him physically shake. I never paid much mind to any of it, because I was too young and naive to understand. The first time was when I was three, and my mom told me about it years later. I was at a woman's house who ran a sort of daycare, and my dad would come every day and sit outside of her house and watch me play. One day, he tried to pick me up from daycare, but the old woman wouldn't let me go because she didn't know who the man was. As a three-year-old, I couldn't understand any of it. When I was six years old, I was out playing in the street with some neighborhood kids when a car pulled up and a large man inside yelled out to me from the car, Go get your mom for me, okay? The sheer size of the man terrified me, and so I and all the other children ran back into our houses. I told my mother what happened, and she ran outside screaming. She later told me I did the right thing, running back in and telling her. She said if I ever saw him again, I should once more run away. Even then, I still didn't know who he was. When I was eight years old, I was walking a few blocks away to a friend's house when a car started following me from behind. I didn't look through the window to see who it was because I was too afraid to look in its direction. I walked faster 
because I thought it would be worse to run, letting the car know that I knew there was trouble. I was walking as fast as I could when I heard a voice call out to me from the car window. Hey there, baby girl. Why don't you come take a ride with your daddy? I recognized the voice. It was the voice from the man when I was six. I immediately began running all the way to my friend's house. I was grateful for my mom always sending my brother to come walk me home when it got dark out, because that car would wait outside for me the whole time, and it would only drive away when they saw my brother. But I never told my mom about it, and my brother didn't notice anything strange, really. I didn't see the car or the man again until I was 11, and by then, I actually knew who he was and what he looked like. It was one of the few times in my life that I didn't tell my mother where I was going before I left the house. She would figure that I was going to my neighborhood friend's place. I met up with my friend one day, and we went to the local dumping grounds to go exploring. It was sometime around sunset. We were out there exploring on a hill surrounded by trees when I saw him hiding there and watching me. I whispered to my friend that someone was staring at us, and we slowly began heading back to his place. But the man followed, whistling behind us. Again, we didn't run, because we didn't want to bring attention to ourselves. He started yelling out to us to slow down, just to come talk to him for a moment. He just wanted to get to know his daughter. We were pretty far from my friend's house, and even further from mine, which I had to get back to. He started to get angry in his tone, and we started running then, back to my friend's place at full speed. We were about a block away when we ran into my brother, who was angry I wasn't where I was supposed to be. By that point, we had already lost my dad, as he didn't run after us once he saw my brother. We told him what had happened, and he just got more irritated with me, and walked me home still scolding me all the way. I didn't see my father again for a long time after that. I found out a few years ago it was because my mother got a restraining order on him. I grew up and went through school, got terrible grades, hung out with the wrong people. My brother left the state, and my mom became more and more addicted. I was 17, failing my senior year of high school, and making worse and worse decisions. That's when I met him again. I was at a Halloween party sometime in mid-October. There were plenty of bad things going around there, Lots of high school and college kids making bad decisions, surrounded by loud music. We were in an open field surrounded by trees and a dirt parking lot. It was sometime after midnight. I'll admit by the time I noticed him, I was completely plastered. Some part of my mind recognized him and knew he was dangerous, but I was having so much fun in my mind state that I didn't really care. When the party slowed down some time around three in the morning, I decided it was time to go home. I lost my keys to a friend and had to walk home alone. I figured it was three miles and wouldn't be that far. I assumed I'd be okay. The path I took to get home went through a short patch of trees, through a run-down neighborhood, and then over some city streets back to the crappy apartment that my mother and I were living at. I didn't even notice I was being followed until he started whistling. I didn't look back because I wasn't worried, figuring it was just another party goer who lived in this area. But then he started yelling out to me, Hey, baby girl, slow down, slow down. I just want to talk. Don't you want to see your daddy? You ain't seen me in years, girl. Come on, slow down. That was when I started to walk faster. At that point, I was starting to sober up from the fear, but I was still unsteady in my movements and did not trust myself running. He kept calling out for me until I hit the city streets that marked the halfway point to getting home. That's when he started to sound more violent. Hey, you better stop walking right now. I'm your daddy. 
I ain't gonna ask again nicely. I was scared out of my mind, so I tried running. I wasn't very fast, and he caught up to me quickly. He caught me in a sort of backwards bear hug. I tried wiggling away, but I was far too weak and far too drunk to get free. He started whispering in my ear, You're mine now, baby girl. You're my daughter, and I own you. I can do whatever I want, because you are mine. He said it over and over to me in my ear. I started to scream, but there was no one around to hear me. Not a single car on the road. He put his hand up to my mouth to stifle my screams, and I bit him as hard as I could. It was just enough to make him move back enough I could kick him, and that's how I got free from his grasp. I sprinted as fast as I could, knowing full well that the only place I could go was home. It wasn't a good neighborhood. I couldn't just go up to someone's house for safety, and in a time before cell phones, I could not call for help. I ran as fast as I could manage, and he almost caught me again several times. When I finally got home, I thanked the world that my mom left the door unlocked. I locked him out, but he continued to pound on the door demanding I let him in, eerily repeating the same thing he had said before. My mom was passed down on the couch too far gone to know what was going on, and we didn't have a working landline in the apartment, so I couldn't call the cops. Thankfully, though, one of my neighbors was so annoyed with the loudness, they called the cops themselves and filed a noise complaint. And after ten or so minutes of constant pounding on the door and me being scared, the police arrived. They arrested him, and my mom finally came to terrified of being arrested herself. When she found out what was going on, she cried and apologized for being so messed up. My dad spent a couple of months in jail. We moved while he was in, and for the last few decades, I've had that fear that he would come back. But I have my life together now. I have my own family and kids, and I fear for them too. My mom told me after it all was over, that she knew he was stalking me the entire time. She told me she left him in the first place because he was physically cruel and he had charges for doing things to kids, specifically my brother. She didn't want the same to happen to me. He had stalked me my whole life, even when he had the restraining order. Sometimes when I'm alone at night, that's the thought that crosses my mind, that I was being followed every second of every day, and for most of it, I never even noticed. My only hope now is that he never finds me or my kids. I'm not too sure how I would react if he ever did, but the thought of it scares me. Four, my grandma and the creepy daycare, by you slash Belle Marie and read by Unit 522. Some backstory. This happened when my grandparents were in their early to mid-twenties. My grandma worked at daycares and schools for a while, but she quit when she had kids of her own. She would have kind of an unofficial daycare babysitting job at their house, taking care of some of the neighbor's kids whose parents worked during the day. Some new neighbors had just moved in down the street, a husband and wife, and they had two kids of their own. This was the 1960s suburbia, very different times. They invited my grandparents over for dinner one night. The wife was showing my grandma around the house a bit, and as it turned out, they ran a daycare center from their house. She showed my grandma the room they used. Grandma had some trouble connecting with this woman, so of course she mentioned that she also ran a daycare at home. This woman immediately got angry with her, asking if it was official and licensed and whatnot. Well, it wasn't, and she explained to the woman that it really wasn't a daycare, just her babysitting for some neighbor kids at her house, and they were just calling it one. This seemed to calm the woman down, and they were able to have a normal dinner. Although the husband and wife kept recommending to my grandparents that they send over the neighbor kids, as well as my mom and uncle over to their house, as they were a accredited daycare center, instead of my grandma taking care of them. 
Well, dinner went fine, and my grandparents left. A little creeped out, but whatever. A few years later, my grandma was reading the paper and saw that the husband had been arrested for molesting children, his own, as well as the ones that were supposedly safe in their accredited daycare home. To this day, my grandma thinks that the reason that the woman was so defensive is because she knew something was going on with her husband. Five. He keeps calling my name. By Mava. We were at a friend's house for the night and wound up talking about the paranormal and our own experiences with it. And while I was recounting what I'd always dismissed as a creepy waking dream, I realized it wasn't so banal after all. When I was little, I never slept during the day. Even these days, I have a hard time taking a nap in the middle of the day. And of course, during nap times in my daycare, I never could fall asleep, but I was required to lay down in the darkened room on my colorful mattress. But I'd simply stare at the ceiling while everyone else would doze off. Most of us were on the floor, but there were a few bunk beds along the wall. There weren't enough for all of us, though. So we would rotate bed spots and the mattresses covered for the rest of us. Or, well, I was always on a mattress. I didn't sleep, I didn't get a bed, and I didn't really care. It was better that someone who actually needed to get comfortable for napping got one. One day at daycare, though, I was lying there as usual. That room had two doors facing each other on the opposite walls, and I was right by the other one. The teacher was sitting there between them, but I had unobstructed view of the other door, the one that led to the entrance. There was a little bit of light streaming in through the heavy curtains on the windows and under the doors. I must have fallen asleep, which was really weird for me, because I saw the door opposite of me was suddenly being opened. Light was steadily flowing in. I could not see the entryway because there was a very, very large man or a shadow of a man, anyway, in the doorway. He was wearing a hat and a long, wide coat, and his head almost reached to the top of the doorframe. I never saw the man walk there or open the door. He was just suddenly there, and the door was open. The teacher did not react, nor did I, thinking I'd be punished for getting up. The man, though, didn't move, and as I watched him, a feeling filled my mind. He was there to take me somewhere. He wanted me to go with him, and I wanted to go with him too. He felt safe, like a parent, and it must have been important if he wanted to get me during nap time. But I still was not allowed to move, and the teacher didn't seem to even see the man. Something told me that she would not understand if I tried to tell her, so I did not go to the man and eventually he would disappear and the door would be shut once more. That in itself may have been a dream. In fact, back then I thought it was. I was telling the story to a friend at a sleepover once. Ever since that day or somewhere around it, I would hear my name being chanted in my ears every time it got quiet. It made me quite the chatterbox, actually. I did not want to hear the voice anymore. It felt like it was accusing me of something. It started ever since I saw the man in daycare. The man had wanted me to go with him and I didn't. And for that, I was a bad child. Eventually, when I was around 15, I realized that I no longer heard his voice. I never actually thought I was being called and it wasn't a hallucination. Rather, it was the hum that just sometimes appears in your ears, gaining a rhythm and then forming into words, or rather, a word. To me, it was Mava, Mava, over and over, until another noise could drown it out. Two years or so ago, I started hearing my mother call my name from downstairs, but she would be sleeping, or not even in the house at the time. This time, it sounded so real that I often called back, asking if she needed anything. A few times, I even went downstairs to find that the whole house was empty. 
Now that, too, has gone away. It did often happen when I was already listening to music, and sometimes upon playing it back, I would find that it was just some sound that I mistook for my mother's voice, but not every time. I'm not sure what to do, or even if I could do anything. I'm still not completely scared, I think. I can't help but wonder, is it a spirit like the Grim Reaper? If so, it might just want me early. When you leave what you love most in the hands of a stranger, the worst is sure to happen. It might not be there when you get back, or it might not be the same as it was before. In this case, what you left is your child. Who knows what might happen if you leave them in the hands of someone else? In a world like ours, you never truly know what might happen. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to Unit as well with the link in the description if you loved his sultry voice. If you want to hear your scary story narrated on this channel, send it to me at darknessprevails.org slash submit. If you want to support my channel, you can go to patreon.com slash darknessprevails and donate any amount to get your name in the credits. Go to morbidmonsters.com and get some creepy cool Darkness Prevails merchandise or download my free app Spooked from the Google Play Store. Now then, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about 10 scary stories from abandoned places. Brody says, loving the new profile picture, Darkness. A lot of you keep asking why I changed it. Well, it had some terrible imagery that YouTube didn't like. You know, that red fluid that's inside all of us. That's bad, so I removed it. Sad day. I even changed my channel banner, but I think I like the new one better. Oh, it's the CIA, and they say this is the worstest video ever. Apparently, that means it's the best, which is incorrect for as long as that Shrek SFM video still exists. Nicholas Champion says, I remember playing your forest stories at our first scouts campout. No one got to sleep that night, and we happened to be near an abandoned location. Keep us the scares. Haven't missed a video since I started watching in April. Good to have you aboard, Mr. Champion. Might as well call me the god dang boogeyman with how many kids I scare on a daily basis and how often I pick my nose. Cookie Monster says, Hey, I love listening to the stories you put out. Yeah, that's right, Cookie Monster. Daddy Darkness always puts out. And Donnie Yeager says, Why do you people keep coming to my house? Sorry, Donnie, your mom is just too hot. Anyways, guys, thanks so much for tuning in to another banger episode of Darkness Prevails. Here are the credits to my patrons who donate to support this channel. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy.